How do you begin to explain anything as macabre and bizarre as the weekend events surrounding the California religious cult known as the People's Temple in Guyana? Tonight we'll try to make some sense of it. But first, the latest incredible facts. Authorities in Guyana confirmed late today that they had counted the bodies of 383 Americans at the temple's campsite in the jungle near the Venezuelan border. They'd apparently died in a mass murder and suicide. There were 163 women, 138 men, and 82 children. Some had been shot, many had been poisoned. The Guyana government say the victims had lined up to take poison brewed in a large vat. Among the dead was the charismatic leader of the cult, Jim Jones, his wife and one of his children, all poisoned. The mass, mass deaths occurred shortly after members of the cult ambushed and killed California Congressman Leo Ryan on Saturday after a visit to investigate complaints by members. Four other Americans died, NBC News correspondent Don Harris and NBC cameraman Robert Brown, San Francisco Examiner photographer Gregory Robinson and Patricia Park, an American reported to be a member of the cult. Mark Lane, the American lawyer who was in Guyana to represent the cult, said members of the cult were talking about mass suicide as he fled the camp. He heard many bursts of automatic weapons fire and the voice of Jones over the camp loudspeaker shouting, Mother, 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 Mother. Another 500 to 700 Americans thought to be at the camp are missing, but may have fled into the jungle. The United States government is sending military transport planes to collect the bodies of the suicide victims. Tonight, the background to the People's Temple cult and the events that led to the killings. Jim? Robin Congressman Leo Ryan's administrative assistant, Joe Holtzinger, was also one of his closest friends. They had known each other for more than 15 years. Mr. Holtzinger flew from Washington to San Francisco early this evening to be on hand when the congressman's body arrived from Guyana. I interviewed Mr. Holtzinger before he left. It was late this afternoon before confirmation came that the Reverend Jones, leader of the People's Temple cult, was dead. I asked Mr. Holtzinger to begin at the beginning. What were the circumstances which first led to Congressman Ryan's interest in this group, the People's Temple? A uh, meeting he had about a year ago, or a year and a half ago to two years, he had the habit of having constituent meetings in people's homes, that is, meeting with them in their family situation, discuss their problems. And one of the people he met with was the Houston family in San Bruno, California. Sammy Houston is an AP photographer and is an old, is an old friend of Leo's. They knew each other for 25 years, and uh, Leo Newman trusted him, and uh, uh, when Sammy called for help, why, we went to see him. Uh, and this subject came up. Uh, Sammy's son, Bob Houston, had been a high school student of Leo, so he was a high school teacher, and so he knew the whole family. Bob Houston became a member of the People's Temple, and uh, in his 20s or thereabouts, he uh, uh, had two small children and uh, a wife, and he had joined the People's Temple. And the report we got from the family was that Bob had decided to leave the People's Temple. He had given them his salary, and he worked at the railroad yards in San Francisco, and given them his salary, and I guess his possessions, and he believed completely in this program, this group. Mm -hmm. uh, then apparently one night or one day he told uh, the people at the People's Temple, or whoever, Jones or whomever, that he was going to leave. He was thinking of leaving the temple. The next night he was found dead at the railroad yards. It was never determined whether it was an accident 
for homicide. There was no witnesses, and nobody knew what happened. But the Houston family were convinced there had been a violent act. Uh, the two children uh, were taken to Jonestown when they moved to Jonestown. Jonestown, that's the, in the location Guyana, in, in Guyana. In Guyana. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I guess, the, from what I understand, the mother went with them originally, and then she got out or gave them away. And the mother and the grandparents tried to get these two children out, but they were getting social security payments for their, as, as orphans. And the money was going down to Guyana because that was their address, and apparently the People's Temple was cashing those checks. And it was the Houston family's belief that the reason for holding those two children there was to get that money. Uh, there were other considerations uh, that they were afraid of might be happening there also to the children. Uh, Leo, in a rather uh, emotional scene, promised Sam that he would do everything he could to get those grandchildren back who were being held apparently against their will. That started it. That was about a year and a half ago. Yes. Uh, then, uh, because the Houston family knew other families who had similar problems, we started getting other contacts from relatives who had problems of the same type with the People's Temple. What kind of problems? Uh, Having uh, relatives, being, they felt, being held against their will. Mm -hmm. And then we started meeting refugees, people who had gotten away from the People's Temple, who had been members there before, including people who had, one man had been the bodyguard of Jim Jones, another person who had been very close in the leadership. And these people had somehow gotten away and were uh, very concerned, and they had uh, some pretty drastic stories to tell. Like what? What kind of stories? Stories of uh, physical intimidation, of psychological intimidation, of uh, almost even of torture and of... Uh, physical torture? Yes. Uh, if somebody was being punished, they had uh, physical uh, punishment for people. It was a total society that was uh, supposedly all for one and all for one. Trust everybody. As it turned out, it became more and more an authoritarian society uh, based on one man's mind. And that was the will of Jim Jones. Jim Jones. And uh, so we uh, heard these stories. We started documenting them over the last few months. We had been in touch with the State Department over the last year, but the State Department was convinced, based upon a few visits there, some of their personnel had gone out there, that it was benign, peaceful settlement, just a attempt at uh, communal living, and that there was nothing wrong. And I can understand why they were convinced of that, because Jones did a tremendous job of... Uh, mind-bending a lot of important and, and substantial people. It was, uh, he was a, uh, just an incredible uh, personality. But then, but the congressman decided to go see for himself. Why? What, what prompted that, the trip well, itself? Because there was no other way to, to uh, find out the truth and to help the people who had relatives there who they said were being held against their will. There were lawsuits, uh, successful in California courts. When we went to the, they went to the Guyana courts to expedite those lawsuits or to to use the Guyana law. There was never any decision that seemed to be, there was no way to break through that land so many hundreds of, you know, thousands of miles away. And here you had uh, all these people that were there and Leo didn't know what was going on and he had constituents, people in his district who desperately needed his help. And he had a very strong feeling about helping constituents. He felt his job was a representative, was a service one. Did he go down there specifically just to see what the situation was or did he go there with the idea of bringing some people out? Both. He went down to investigate the situation to find out what the truth was. He did not know when he went down uh, which way it would go. Whether it be a combination, he had no idea. But he went down, as he often did, on difficult situations to, by a personal visit, to investigate and to find out what the circumstances were, to find out if American laws were being broken by use of uh, IRS laws or Social Security laws. But he was determined. If you found people down there were being held against their will, that he would bring them out. Were there any prearrangements made with Jones and his people at the commune themselves? In other words, did they know that the congressman and his party were, was coming? Yes. Were coming? On November the 1st, uh, Leo sent a long wire to the Reverend Jones and a similar wire to Ambassador Burke. And it was a very conciliatory wire. Ambassador was, Burke being whom? The American ambassador in Georgetown in Guyana. In Guyana, all right. And uh, telling him his impending visit and... Uh, saying that, in fact, he had heard conflicting stories, but he was down there to be helpful, and he knew that this had been Jones' life work. It was a very conciliatory letter. Uh, and so this was communicated, and he asked them to work through our embassy in Guyana and through, uh, to make all arrangements that were necessary, and he asked that he would hope to meet with Jones either in Georgetown or in Jonestown, and he would like to have their cooperation and uh, look forward to meeting with them. Did he get an answer? The only answer he got, he got two answers. One was through our embassy, stating that uh, there were certain conditions that the People's Temple or Jones was putting on the visit. 
And the second answer was that he, they wanted him to work with Mark Lane, who had uh, visited uh, an attorney who had visited Jonestown some time before that. It was interesting because they didn't tell him to work through Charles Gary in San Francisco, who had been their general counsel. Mm -hmm. And uh, why they chose uh, Lane instead of Gary was a mystery to us and to Gary as well. Did the State Department or anyone else uh, tell you, the congressman, or anyone in your office that, hey, this trip could be dangerous, these people might be hostile towards you? No. They never did. The only uh, warnings of hostility came from myself and from Jackie Spear, the people who had been investigating it. His legal counsel went down with him and myself because we had conducted the investigation. We told him what we had, and he also knew from the People's Temple relatives and refugees personally of what they said the danger would be. As far as the State Department was concerned, uh, the only indication we had from them was uh, one of caution about housing conditions, that uh, there was a lot, so many people going down might have a difficult time finding housing. They had no idea of the danger in the State Department. Mm -hmm. But you say you did. Well, that was because I had talked to people uh, who had been down there and to the relatives, and uh, that I was not sure. I had, we had all heard the stories. I mm -hmm. cautioned Leo about the danger because that was, he was my close personal friend, and I was concerned for him, but he had been through this sort of thing before, through dangerous situations before, and he said, you can't let your decisions be based on fear, you have to put fear aside and do what you think is right, and he went there with that attitude. Based on your knowledge, uh, uh, from taking the reports and the complaints that you had, had received in the office, uh, does what happened in Guyana fit the pattern of Jones and his people? Too completely. Uh, as Ron Jarvis of San Francisco Chronicle said, everything terrible that ever been said about, jo about the People's Temple turned out to be true. It was, a, uh, it was like uh, uh, Charles Manson's family uh, magnified a thousand times. It was uh, incredible. Well, there, there are reports today, uh, as you know, that uh, Jones himself uh, may, may be alive. In other words, he was not one of the three or four hundred people who were found dead at uh, Jonesville or Jones at the, uh, the camp there in Guyana. Does that surprise you at all, no. that he would not die with his people? No. The man has been a master at using other people, but uh, I don't think anybody of that caliber ever has intentions of uh, doing himself, and I think he's just a manipulator of others. Who are the others? Who are his followers? Is there any way to characterize these people in any general way? I think so. I think they're generally people who are, uh, if anything, a little over-emotional, kind people, people who are troubled, who have had hard times. And they're made, the one theme that runs throughout these people has been that they joined because they were looking for brotherhood. They were looking for love, for acceptance. They were looking for everything that was, uh, you would call kind and good. But they had a need for other people. And Jones played on that, promised them all that, and then said, trust me. And he went through the most bizarre ways of proving trust, such as training them to drink poison, just in case at one time it might be poison, of sharing all their possessions, perhaps sharing each other. It was sort of a total acceptance he preached, and these people wanted to believe. They wanted to find something in which to believe, and they believed in this uh, all, total equality and total sharing, and that was what he used to build this insane empire. The reports that these three to four hundred people, uh, some of them may have committed suicide by taking poison, is that, does that fit with your knowledge of this group? I have my doubts about that. I know that he practiced them in taking poison. Uh, I'm not sure that it wasn't murder, that it wasn't mass murder. Uh, he had them uh, bent every which, their minds bent out of shape. But uh, something tells me that uh, somehow the people who were ex who died may well have been the people most likely to have wanted to leave. As Jim said, that interview was recorded before the Guyanan authorities confirmed that Jones had been found dead among the other apparent suicide victims who had been poisoned. The People's Temple cult first came to wide public attention with investigative reports in New West magazine in California beginning in August 1977. The Reverend Jim Jones, who'd been appointed head of the San Francisco Housing Authority, resigned from that job and fled to Guyana shortly before the articles appeared. Phil Tracy is a contributing editor for the magazine and co-author of the articles on the People's Temple. Mr. Tracy, can you tell us a few basic things first? How many members did the temple have? 
Well, I claim to have 20,000, but uh, our investigations show that it was never more than 9,000. And what kind of people were they in race, age, sex, economic conditions, basically? Well, it covered uh, all, uh, every gamut, but the uh, majority of the uh, congregation was black, and a substantial number, 50 to 60 percent, were uh, elderly black people living on Social Security. What was the appeal that recruited them? Brotherhood. I uh, think the congressman's aide that you just uh, was on tape said it best. He, he, he reached out for people who, uh, who were tired of uh, simply chasing a buck and who wanted to, to uh, work with other people and who wanted to make it a better world. And he, uh, once he got them inside, he found out what their fears or their, uh, uh, their needs were, and he played on them. He was a master manipulator. Uh, one of these kinds of people that come around every once in a while and, uh, and really sweep people up, and, uh, and that's how he worked it. What did they believe in, in of a religious nature? Well, uh, I, my investigation showed that, that the religious element was quickly discarded uh, once you uh, got inside the temple, that Jones really, didn't, uh, really wasn't a, a, a practicing Christian minister. He was a member of the, uh, an ordained minister in the Disciples of Christ Church, but uh, that uh, within the temple itself, he even openly preached against the Bible. Mm -hmm. So that it was more of a, an equality and a social revolution based on brotherhood was what he, he preached. But uh, as the congressman's aide again said a while ago, it quickly devolved into a, uh, into a militaristic society. Your articles spoke of violence being used to, for discipline. What kind of violence? Well, they used, uh, they used a, a large four-foot wooden paddle, beating children, sometimes 100, 150 uh, uh, shots at a time. Um, they also used a uh, four-foot uh, low-level cattle prod, which they called a one-eyed monster. And... Uh, they would, uh, they would uh, uh, use that on, on children and on members who had violated some kind of minor rule like talked out of turn or expressed un undue affection for somebody or maybe they'd eaten too much. And giving them electric shocks with the cattle That's correct. Uh, what kind of a man was Jones himself? Um, well, I only got to meet him once and um, he was uh, uh, very vain, um, very egocentric. Um, he was very fluent. Um, he, uh, he made a convincing argument. At the time that I spoke to him, I didn't know very much myself about what was going on inside the temple. I didn't even have the rumors at that point. I just knew there was something wrong because uh, he, was, uh, he was an ordained minister, and yet he traveled around the city with 10 or 12 bodyguards, and his uh, people were searched regularly before the services. So it looked strange. Uh, but... Uh, why did he move part of the cult to Guyana, part of the group to Guyana, and how many did he take? He took about 1,000 to 1,200, as best we can determine, and uh, from conversations with people who were inside the temple before, uh, our, uh, before they went to Guyana uh, and left after he went to Guyana, um, they, they said that it was, uh, it was in part due to the publication of the stories uh, in, in New West Magazine, as well as the subsequent publication in the, uh, both the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Francisco Examiner. Uh -huh. From what you know, what might have explained what happened this weekend in Guyana, particularly the mass suicide? Well, um, Jones had a, um, um, a, a trained uh, SWAT teams, about 30 heavily armed uh, uh, black ghetto youth and they were his main force, his main muscle in Guyana. I suspect they got out of control. And uh, if Jones had wanted to kill the congressman and his, uh, the rest of the reporters and, and not have it found out, and they had thought it through, they would have, they would have killed him in, in Port Kaitoum or at the, at the mission itself and then tried to hide the bodies. And uh, so the way it happened just it would seem to indicate it was the kind of thing uh, where emotions got out of control and he had heavily armed uh, youth that um, just didn't know what they were doing. Mr. Tracy, thank you. We'll come back.
The People's Temple is one of many unusual religious groups which have sprung up in this country, particularly in California, in recent years. Irving Zaretsky is an anthropologist and lawyer who studied many of them. While attached to the University of Chicago Divinity School, Mr. Zaretsky published a book called Religious Movements in Contemporary America. Dr. Zaretsky, what does the People's Temple have in common with these other religious cults, and which ones? Well, I think that it is very much like other contemporary religious movements, uh, trying to give people a religious ideology, but effectively giving them, as Mr. Tracy said, secular services, self-help, uh, an opportunity to improve their life, an opportunity to redefine themselves personally and collectively. I think it is like the Moon Church or Scientology or the Maharaji group or the Hare Krishna in the sense that it is a total institution for some people. Without they, saying that any of those groups necessarily follow these practices. Of course. Yes. Uh, but analytically, they offer uh, a total institution where individuals live all day long and all evening long in the group. They give them of the fruits of their labors, their salaries, their wages, and so on, sometimes their earthly possessions. Uh, they are disciplined to be able to get along within the group and to share with others the responsibilities of carrying the group forward. Um, I think that they primarily appeal to individuals who have gone through a crisis very recently in their life. These are really individuals who are seekers. They have gone from group to group in search of an elusive happiness or fulfillment or the realization of a personal goal. Why is violence necessary for the disciplinary factor? I'm not sure that violence is necessary for the disciplinary factor, but you, you do find the discipline is necessary if you're going to make any large heterogeneous group work together. Now, in the service of discipline, sometimes a variety of methods are used. Certainly, groups such as uh, the People's Temple and other religious cults are vanguards of our society, and they rely on vogues and trends that already exist within our society. Violence is very much part of the American scene today. As recent reports have come out, the most violent place in America is the home, the nuclear family. To the extent that these groups substitute a social family for a biological family, it is not uncommon or unusual to find that violence exists in those circles. Now, as you know recently, uh, corporal punishment has been reintroduced in the schools. We are now a society that tends to value discipline as opposed to progressivism, a kind of reaction to the Dr. Spock upbringing. To the extent that that kind of discipline is, is called discipline as opposed to violence, and what happens in the People's Temple is called violence as opposed to discipline, we're in trouble. I think it's important to characterize all these phenomena by single sets of terms that accurately report what we find. And that is violence, whether in the home, in the school, or in a voluntary organization or a religious group, is violence. And I think we ought not to camouflage it under the category of discipline. How do you explain the success of such groups today? The success of such groups uh, lies, I think, heavily with the followers. Uh, in other words, a person like Reverend Jones could not have been successful unless he had a coterie of individuals who were willing to submit themselves to such discipline. And we are a society that have offered a schmogesburg of opportunities for people's self-discovery and the discovery of others. And to the extent that people simply, be, their threshold becomes ever higher as a result of experimenting with various kinds of groups, they are willing to try the ultimate, which is pain and suffering in pursuit of joy and brotherhood. Can I ask you a final question? Can you at all explain to yourself the now documented mass suicide, or at least that part of it that was suicide? Yes, I look at it very much as the phenomena of when prophecy fails. That is to say, when individuals have followed a charismatic leader for a long period of time and hope that a certain prophecy will realize itself and personal happiness will in fact arrive or utopia will be arrived at. And that prophecy does not come true. If an individual exists in his own societies in near proximity to family, kin, kith, friends, and so on, he is able to hold his belief in suspension and to veer away from that group and look for another group and have that prophecy be realized at a later time. When you're left in an alien society, out of touch with anything that is familiar to you and no support structure to bolster you, then you follow, in fact, the lead of others. And I'm sure that this kind of a suicide, to the extent that it was a suicide, and I'm not convinced of that, would have fallen in that tradition that no support structures at the time when prophecy fails leads to a phenomenon of follow the leader. Thank you. Jim? Mr. Tracy, 
first to you. What about the members of the People's Temple who are still alive, either in Guyana or in San Francisco? Are they liable to commit more violence? I don't believe so. Um, I think that most of the uh, temple members who are what you would call hardcore fanatical followers of the Reverend Jones left uh, in the uh, summer of 1977 and that uh, the people left here in San Francisco uh, were people who in unwilling to go to Guyana and, and as a result of that uh, I, I don't think that uh, those that are here now are going to take their lives here in the city or in uh, the rest of California. Well, there were reports, as I'm sure you've heard, unconfirmed at this point, that people in the San Francisco area in California who may have criticized the cult in the past, that, uh, that some of the, uh, the still-living members might try to take retribution, there was police protection for them, and that sort of thing. Do you think well, that they're liable to do anything like that now? That's a possibility. That's a distinct possibility. Um, uh, the uh, past history of, of dealing with this temple, when uh, uh, these, these former members Oh, each one of them had, a, had dozens of threatening letters and, 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 and just numerous tales about uh, uh, threatening telephone calls and even visits to their home after they left the temple. Yeah. Uh, I myself and, uh, and the editors at New West also received uh, death threats during the period when we were trying to conduct our investigation. And uh, on light of the, this morning, it certainly, <laughs> certainly wouldn't want to assume that, the, that, that, that it's not possible. Yeah. Dr. Zaretsky, let me ask you a question. Does a group like this normally disintegrate once its charismatic leader, a person like Jones, dies or leaves the scene? Well, they don't have to disintegrate it, to the extent that schismatic movements were afoot before his death. A certain small coterie of individuals can follow one of his main cadre personnel and form a substitute group. Mm -hmm. However, it's quite likely, and perhaps more likely, that these groups will simply search out for themselves new or existing groups in the Bay Area and begin to follow them for the same purposes that they joined the People's Temple to begin with. Does that add up that way to you, Mr. Tracy, that these people without Jones will just kind of uh, spread to the winds to other groups, or do you think the People's Temple will continue to exist without Jones? I think the professor's right. I think that they will spread to other groups uh, if they get involved at all. If, uh, uh, Possibly they may have decided not to ever get involved with another group like this again. All right. Gentlemen, thank you. All right, finally, a personal note. I knew Don Harris, the NBC News correspondent who died in Guyana. I knew him well. He and I worked together, but for different news organizations in Texas in the early 70s. He was anchoring a local newscast at the time, and he hated everything about it except the money. One day over lunch, he told me, no more. I can't stand it, sitting there like a grinning ninny, all prim and proper, reading stories somebody else has written, stories I don't know anything about because I wasn't there myself. I'm a reporter. I want to be out there where the news is, not back in some studio trading inane jokes with the weatherman and the sports guy. That was Don Harris, a good friend, a good reporter. Robin? That's all for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow night. I'm Robert McNeil. Good evening. Good in the news tonight, McGuire Air Force Base has been set up as the control center for the planned airlift of hundreds of bodies, the victims of the mass suicide in Jonestown, Guyana. There are those who thought the deaths of more than 900 Americans at Jonestown some two years ago also meant the virtual end of cults in America. But a look around the state proves that's not necessarily so. In fact, Jonestown figures prominently into one of groups' plans to get off the ground, not only in New Jersey, but also in the rest of the country. Reporter Tom Stewart went to Montclair to take a closer look. It's hard to believe the daughter of the U.S. congressman gunned down prior to the mass suicide at Jonestown would turn around and join a cult herself. But that's exactly what Shannon Ryan, whose father Leo Ryan was killed by Jim Jones's followers, has gone and done. To me, I, I keep saying this over and over again, it's not ironic because it's just... Um, in a way, it's beautiful because what happened two years ago to my father allowed me to be where I am right now. And that this might not have been possible for me if that hadn't happened. And if it weren't for Shannon Ryan, you'd probably never have heard of Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh and his cult of disciples. Not unless you read the January 16, 1978 issue of Time magazine. The story referred to Rajneesh as the Swami of Sex alleging pilgrims at the cult's commune in India sometimes would, quote, doff all their clothes and wriggle in ecstasy. 
Times said Rajneesh was known as India's sex guru from 1969 to 1974, when he moved into this posh new commune. The Rajneesh International Distribution Center is located right here in Montclair, New Jersey. On sale are the appropriate shawls, robes, and beads direct from India, plus postcards of the master, brochures, and his meditations on tape and in books. This one goes for $320. The Montclair operation is an extension of the cult's main headquarters in Pune, India, a commune called an ashram, where the guru daily delivers his meditations. You are afraid of your own potential. You are not afraid of me. You are not afraid of sannyas. You are afraid of your own longing that you may take the jump. Shannon Ryan, who now goes by the name Amrita Preton, took that jump last fall, spending three months at the ashram, where the staff reportedly works for nothing but room and board. It's totally different. Everything about this is positive. I, I haven't seen any, anyone getting hurt. I haven't seen anyone uh, being held against their will. Ryan is one of the best things that ever happened to the cult, which claims 200,000 members in some 40 countries. Since her return to the U.S. in late December, she's been the main attraction in a national push for more members, making the network talk show circuit. Rajneesh's executive secretary, visiting from India, acknowledged the cult as making the most of her Jonestown connection. I, I would say, um, yes, I can look at it that way, yes, but I would just like to have her even without that, if, if that is so, too. She's a Bhagwan's disciple, and brings loving energy here. Anand Sheila, whose name means blissful fragrance, discounts any chance of a Jonestown-style tragedy among followers of Rajneesh, who says he's for the death of the mind, not the body. Every coin has two sides, one positive and one negative. Bhagwan is the positive, Jonestown is the negative. But Shannon Ryan has been quoted in Newsweek saying that if the guru did ask the ultimate sacrifice of her, meaning suicide, she'd do it. That's the kind of talk that's earned the Rajneesh cult a place on the hit list of Citizens Freedom Foundation, a watchdog group of parents that works on keeping kids out of cults. Cults look for people that are in a transition stage, and young adulthood is certainly the most important transitional stage in one's life. William Goldberg, an expert on mind control and member of that foundation, leads a therapy group that treats people influenced by cults. People that have been involved with this group and have loved ones in the group have told me that there's a tremendous cult of the personality of Rajneesh. In other words, that the individual members of the group don't have a feeling of autonomy, a feeling of being in control of themselves or their mind when they're uh, involved in the group. Rajneesh encourages them to completely dissolve the mind. That gives me a great deal of concern because what it does is to uh, encourage a feeling of dependency, obviously. If I don't have any answers, I've got to look to the enlightened one that has all of the answers. Goldberg says he's recently heard from several parents worried about the possibility of their children joining the Rajneesh group in Montclair, the place Shannon Ryan reportedly now calls home. One can only wonder what her father, who lost his life stopping one cult, would say about her joining another. I feel higher from my experience uh, at the ashram and with Bhagwan than I have ever felt in my life before. And the experience with my father was the lowest I've ever felt. Come. Drink out of it. And your thirst will be quenched forever. But you will have to pay the price. Just wearing orange clothes, you will be known as a madman. That's what I want you all to be known all over the world, my mad people. God is only for those who are mad enough. Rajneesh spokesman in Montclair said today there's been an explosion of interest in the group, including correspondents from all over the country, and they give most of the credit for that response to Shannon Ryan. Karen? 
Tom, how did uh, Shannon get interested in this group in the first place? Well, actually, it's a fairly typical story, except, of course, for what happened to her father. But middle-class young people who sense something missing in their lives often look somewhere else for fulfillment, and that often turns out to be Eastern religious cults. In this case, Shannon Ryan had tried school, all sorts of jobs, as a change girl at a Lake Tahoe casino, museum guard, court reporter, finding nothing that suited her until a friend returned from the ashram in India. At that point, she reportedly used some of her father's insurance money to pay about $2,600 in plane fares and entrance fees to the Rajneesh commune in Pune. Incidentally, that group claims the number of Americans making that same trip has doubled in the past six hmm. months. Okay. Now the story of a new play in California that raises disturbing questions from the past. Spencer Michaels has our report. I'm ready to die now. Darkness settles over Jonestown on its last day on Earth. Okay, hold. On a stage in Berkeley, California, actors rehearsed The People's Temple, a new highly anticipated play that tells the story of Pastor Jim Jones and his followers, most of whom died in South America 27 years ago. Today, all that many people can recall about People's Temple is the death of a congressman and three journalists and the specter of more than 900 bodies lying face down and a vat of poison. I think there are probably people that will only be able to see that image. Stephen Jones is one of Jim Jones' surviving sons who grew up with temple members, mostly poor African Americans who had joined a California-based church that pledged integration and a better life. I would like um, for the people that I knew and loved to be known better than that. Um, and and I, don't want, I, I don't want the story to be sugar-coated. You know, we were capable of, of real heights and, and great lows and everything in between. Stephen Jones' father, Jim Jones, was a progressive and ultimately dictatorial leader and a faith healer who promised a finer, fairer world and who led his followers to a jungle utopia called Jonestown. Who were the temple members and why did they believe Jones and ultimately follow him to their deaths? Were those deaths suicide or murder? Those are some of the questions raised by the play as in this scene with the actor who plays Stephen Jones. I know I was. I can't imagine all the guilt I, I feel about the decisions that I've made. If I made others, I might have saved lives. I might have changed events. Uh, my, if I'd only known, if I'd only done this. Lee Fondakowski wrote and directed The People's Temple for the Berkeley so Repertory Theater. It's the story of these survivors and how they are looking back, how they are putting themselves into the past questioning their choices, questioning their decisions, questioning their humanity, why they did certain things, why they didn't do other things. To me, that's really where the heart and soul of the drama lies. For Stephen Jones, many of those questions didn't have simple answers then <laughs> and still don't. Why were we so ready to believe the, the really ridiculous stories that were being told about the wonder of paradise down there? Um, we were just, we needed so badly for things to be better. We can look in our own country at how ready we are to follow somebody and how easily we get drummed up and, and, uh, and how easily we get put in line with fear. The play's script was drawn from letters of those who died at Jonestown and interviews with survivors. We've taken the text of the people who've died and we've put it right up against the text of the survivors from today. And they're really in this incredible dramatic dialogue, which I think is only possible on stage. I'm the first Negro adopted in the state of Indiana. I get adopted by Jim and Marceline Jones and have a very affluent life. Jim I mean, Jones' adopted son, Jim Jr., is also portrayed in the play. Today he is 44 and a salesman. He says it is important to give voice to the dead. You've heard that Jim Jones was a madman, and let's be candid, he was. Uh, you've heard the uh, swindling of money, the manipulation of politics. You, you've never heard about the movement. You've never heard the voices of the people that, that created this movement. Because Jim Jones could have done it himself. 
Voices like that of Elsie Bell, who died in Jonestown. Life much improved since I joined the People's Temple. And I lifted myself from the cotton fields and the ghettos to, to socialism yes. and a principle to live by. Yes. Oh. Jim Jones' story and the story of his followers survive in these boxes of documents, tapes, artifacts, and photos at the California Historical Society. Those archives become the setting for the play and a major symbol of the people who died in Jonestown. Historical Society curator and author Denise Stevenson, who worked with the writers of the play, still gets emotional just looking at the material. I mean, part of it is about people who believed in something and something terribly tragic happened. And so this story gives us a way to look at what happens when people give up too much for a dream. The archives contain some never before seen images of People's Temple and its members. The John, Johnny Brown Jones. The images bring up a lot of old memories for Jim Jones Jr. Now see, I miss him. Yeah. I, to say I, I miss him. The pictures of Jonestown go through my mind every day. So when I visualize a picture now, it just brings it to the forefront of what was lost. And that's I think and I think that's why I think this play is gonna really demonstrate the potential was lost. Using his own brand of religion, Jim Jones gave his flock confidence they could fulfill that potential. The word is within thee. That's the only word that you'll know. That's the only heaven you'll find. That's the only God you'll know. And he opened his arms to congregants who faltered, like 17-year-old Stanley Clayton, who joined Jones Temple after having been in trouble with the law. Today, he's 51. And it just made me feel really, really good to know that, you know, that this man cared about me, you know, and that uh, I, I had a place in life that from where I was out in the streets, being that I was a nobody, a toe up from the floor up, as they call it, that here he was, he was giving me an opportunity to, to do something for my life. But eventually the media and others began to scrutinize people's temple, and Jones grew paranoid, fearful, and threatened. Jones became convinced his integrated paradise was under attack. In 1978, Congressman Leo Ryan flew to Guyana to investigate charges that Jones was holding people against their will. After defectors approached Ryan, Jones ordered him murdered. At the airport, gunfire killed the congressman and four others. For Jones, his dream of a better world disintegrated. He decreed the deaths of all the residents by poison-laced Kool-Aid. Those who wouldn't drink would be shot. A character playing stage. surviving Temple member Tim Muslim Carter Jones describes the horror. And I uh, turned to my right, and at that exact second, they were squirting poison into my baby son Malcolm's mouth. I saw this with my own eyes. Volunteers were coming up, taking babies out, little newborn babies, taking them out of the mother's arms, and they were actually making them, drinking it out of cups. Stanley Clayton escaped into the jungle just after he saw Jim Jones directing the poisonings. In my eyes, I knew that this was murder. That's why. I always never say suicide, I've always said murder. That was Jonestown. That was the great revolutionary. That was the mass suicide that took place. The play has people once again pondering the disturbing questions Jonestown continues to raise.